Rhodes Gallery Uncovered. Bad behaviour in period costume. A non-judgmental grope into the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains very adult themes, more than a touch of colourful language and scenes of sexual braggadocio, sleazy hide-and-seek and nautical defecation. If you think you may be offended by this, then, well, to be honest, I'm not surprised. But, as you're a grown-up, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't listen. The Ups and Downs of a Gentleman Rotter Shagging for Her Majesty With Queen Victoria's most disreputable army officer, Edward Sellen Before we start, a quick scandalous shout-out to lovable rogue Dottie Hubbard, who dropped me a line at simon at roguesgalleryonline.com addresses in the show notes, to ask me about the Flashman novels of George MacDonald Fraser that I was waxing lyrical about in the last episode, and which indeed have inspired this one. I hope my reply answered some of your queries, Dottie, and thanks for getting in touch. While I'm here, I'd also like to mention Twitter Rogues, R.A. Poe, Second Glance History and Rach A., alongside Facebook Rogues, Edward Cutick, Nicholas Saunders, Mad Matt Coyne, Nectar Vam and Chimp Savin. Or should that be seven? Anyway, I can be found on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram if you want to get hold of me on uh, social media. It's also been nice to see some new names signing up to be lovable rogues at the website. roguesgalleryuncovered.com, link unsurprisingly, is also in the show notes as well. The website has some extra roguish content if you want to check it out and as an LR you get infrequent but fun-packed newsletters. So tell your friends. Oh, and a short notice shout out to Franklin, who got in touch via the website only this morning with some more kind words. Cheers, Franklin. Right, this is going to be a bawdy one, so pay attention. The following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set, and as such may contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists and their times, which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a raging 19th century onanist with some very questionable views on sexual equality, those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. London, 1867 Have you heard? Edward Sellens bloody topped himself. One of the finest writers of gentlemen's erotica that this country has ever seen, and a former Queen's officer to boot, the fellow took a room at Webb's Hotel in Piccadilly, and before the maid could even turn down the bedspread, blew his brains out with a service revolver. To be honest, apart from being jolly poor form, it's left me in a bit of a bind. I'd often retire early for the night, you see, with a copy of one of his books, Perhaps the new Epicurean, the delights of sex, facetiously and philosophically considered in graphic letters addressed to young ladies of quality. Or the simply unputdownable The New Lady's Tickler, or Adventures of Lady Lovesport and the Audacious Harry. And while turning the pages with one hand, engage in a spot of vigorous self-pollution with the other, before collapsing, ashamed and spent, into a well-upholstered armchair. Now I'll have to make do with Charles Bloody Dickens, and this precious little fucking in great expectations, let me tell you. Fortunately, Captain Sellen has left a short but colourful description of his career in the arousingly autobiographical The Ups and Downs of Life, which I purchased from a specialist bookseller just a few short weeks ago. Common sense tells me that much of this account is exaggerated or just plain fiction, but when my blood is up, the curtains are drawn and my study door is firmly bolted, I would swear on the life of Her Majesty that every word was the gospel truth. It was the February of 1834, and Sellen was 16 when he joined the 4th Regiment of the East India Company Madras Infantry as a junior officer. Now you must remember that the 30s were right at the very end of the so-called Regency, the great days of the plunger, the dandy and the Corinthian, before him singing Queen Victoria came to the throne and imposed her tedious morality on the entire empire. He writes that on arriving in Portsmouth to take ship, He was told that bad weather had delayed his sailing and he had at least a week to idle away before setting off. An elderly major returning to his regiment on the same vessel offered the young man a room at his lodgings, which he was sharing with his three nieces. 
Gratefully accepting the offer and then exploring the city, Selen met a roguish fellow in the taproom of a public house who was himself bound for military service in Spain. The two drank each other's health heartily before enjoying a night at the theatre. Upon leaving, they were accosted by the usual gaggle of painted strumpets who prey upon men of sport, and in the surprisingly well-appointed rooms of a filthy garret hovel, Selen was relieved of his virginity by an accommodating prostitute by the name of Polly. Selen claims that he found the experience so invigorating that he fucked Polly three more times and two of her friends twice apiece, before downing two bottles of champagne and returning to his lodgings at five in the morning with his prick as raw as a carrot. Having tasted the intoxicating fruit of Venus, it wasn't long before Selen says he turned his attentions to the Major's three nieces, who, while suitably enamoured of his boyish charms, initially rejected his advances. He had better luck, however, with the chambermaid Mary, who he proceeded to enjoy on three occasions. At the end of their third tryst, Mary admitted that she sometimes spied on couples in the adjoining room through a small hole in the wall and invited Selen to join her. Selen's neighbours were a bluff sea captain and his young wife, and as he pressed his beady eye to the spy hole, Selen was outraged to witness the drunk seaman attempting to take his wife roughly up the Windward Passage, despite her most heartfelt protests. Unable to contain himself, Selen bellowed, I can't stand this, that old scoundrel ought to be taken out and shot. At which point, the shocked sea captain, hearing the voice of Sensia coming apparently from thin air, packed his things and hurried straight to his ship, despite it wallowing in a severe gale. Presenting his compliments to the wife, it should come as no surprise to learn that Selen had soon taken the husband's place in the marital bed, without any of that continental nonsense. Oh. The chambermaid, oh. while jealous, accepted oh. Selen's explanations that he was only doing the poor woman a kindness. Oh. Turning his attentions once more towards the three nieces, a playful Selen started taking them out for long walks, enjoying the effect the high winds had in moulding their cotton dresses to the contours of their bodies. He suggested a game of hide-and-seek and artfully arranged it so that he was not only found lurking behind a tree by all three of them at the same time, but that he was holding his prick in his hand when they did, giving them all a proper eyeful. Two of the nieces were virtuously appalled, but the youngest, Lucy, was intrigued, and he began to dally with her when her uncle fell asleep after dinner, all the while continuing to rendezvous with Mary the chambermaid and the captain's wife. When Mary told him that Lucy was also being pleasured by an older lady who was staying at the lodgings, she saw them through a spy hole, a furious Selen refused to have anything more to do with her. He then talked Mary out of entering a life of prostitution and into marrying a respectable tradesman of her acquaintance. Then, at her request, mind you, put on his army uniform before fucking her, sending her out to fetch some cold ham, visiting the captain's wife and fucking her as well. Selen assures the reader at this point that this is by no means the fevered imaginings of a middle-aged man, but that it actually happened, and I for one believe him. Finally, out at sea and en route to India, Selen continued to visit Lucy in the niece's cabin, despite his reservations, by lowering himself through the deck above their water closet. During the course of the voyage, he managed to deflower not only her, but also her older sister, who was driven to distraction watching him with Lucy. The oldest sister, however, was very disapproving and suspected Selen's intentions were far from honourable because of his often flushed appearance. In a stroke of appalling bad fortune, the next time Selen lowered himself through the ceiling of the WC, she was the person sat upon it performing her natural functions, and an extremely apologetic Selen dropped heavily onto her lap. In the commotion that followed, Selen dived overboard, was hauled back upon deck half drowned, and was subjected to some very harsh words by the captain. On the subject of natural functions, Selen goes on to provide a vivid glimpse into the dangerous life of the seafaring man. Becalmed in eastern waters, one of the sailors was lowered over the side while sitting on a plank to scrape barnacles from the hull. Looking up, he was appalled to see the bare buttocks of one of the other female passengers, who was about to take her ease into the ocean below. Before he could shout ahoy, the lady had carelessly defecated into his left eye, and he was forced to prod her behind with a boat hook to prevent further bombardments. This 
distasteful incident, Sullen says, meant he could no longer look at the lady in question as an object of affection. Arriving in Madras, all three nieces were married to army officers within weeks, but by then, Selen was settling into life as a company officer. One of his favourite pastimes in those early days was to sit on the balcony of his new house, sipping a glass of port and smoking a cheroot, while gazing over the walls of an Anglo-Indian girls' boarding school. Supposedly shielded from prying eyes, the young ladies therein would bathe naked, unaware that Ensign Selen was following their every move. Selen recounts an unsavoury episode when he instructed his butler to offer the woman who ran the school 80 rupees for the opportunity to spend the night with his favourite. It turns out that she had been happily accommodating British officers in this manner for some time, and brought the girl to Selen's room one evening soon after. Unfortunately, when a senior officer heard about this, he was furious that the woman had been offering the girl to one of his juniors rather than himself. Selen, like many officers of his time, was much taken with Indian women, considering them to be more beautiful and sensual than their European counterparts. He wrote, They are scrupulously cleanly in their persons. They are sumptuously dressed. They wear the most costly jewels in profusion. They are well-educated and sing sweetly, accompanying their voices on the viola da gamba, a sort of guitar. They generally decorate their hair with clusters of clematis or the sweet-scented bilwa flowers entwined with pearls of diamonds. They understand in perfection all the arts and wiles of love, are capable of gratifying any tastes, and in face and figure they are unsurpassed by any women in the world. He went on to express this admiration by fucking as many of the local prostitutes as his finances would allow. This isn't to say, however, that he totally neglected European conquests. There was Mrs T, the 26-year-old wife of a 60-year-old major whom he spent many weeks pursuing. He attended her soirees, turned her music for her when she played the viola, accompanied her on strolls and sat with her on the sofa for many hours with his hands up her skirt while she rummaged around inside his breeches. Her husband was blissfully ignorant, suspecting one Captain M of having designs upon his wife but not the boyishly eager Selen, who wrote... Ah, young Selen, there you are again, making love to my wife, you young dog. And he would laugh good-naturedly and slap me on the back, and wily Mrs T would say, Oh yes, he's a good little boy, and as long as he is, so shall he be my knight and wear my colours. When he finally did engage in Congress with the wanton Mrs T, Selen found her to be terrifyingly passionate, using the coarsest of language and sticking her finger up his backside in a burst of wayward enthusiasm. Why this woman, said I to myself, is a perfect messalina, he commented. After pausing for a glass of claret, the couple buckled to again, but were disturbed by a furious hammering on the door. Thinking at the major, Selen grabbed his clothes and fled through the window, naked as a jaybird. However, it was not the major, but Mrs T's other lover, Captain M. Unable to make out Selen's identity, Captain M fired his musket at the young officer as he rowed himself across the river to safety. Running naked through the jungle during the hottest part of the day, Selen was half dead from exhaustion when he finally arrived home, but he knew that a suspicious and angry Captain M would soon be at his door. He soon was. With admirable coolness, Selen told the dusty and furious man that he had not been out of the house all day, as his guts had been playing up following an evening drinking some particularly bad wine. Offering the murderous fellow a cigar, Selen pointed to a mirror and said, Look upon me. Look upon yourself. Would a woman who would choose a stalwart like you condescend to a mere boy like me? Suitably chastened, Captain M apologised profusely and made his exit. In a stroke of appalling bad fortune, however, Selen had left his pocket watch, a gift from his beloved papa, in Mrs T's boudoir, and Captain M took possession of it. Now, all Selen needed to do was keep quiet about his ownership of the watch. But, because it was such a sentimental trinket, he revealed himself to Captain M, who, livid at having been gulled and cuckolded, challenged Selen to a duel. As the challenged party, Selen, who couldn't hit a barn door at two paces with a pistol, chose to fight with swords, a weapon with which he claimed to be much more proficient. In the resulting duel, despite his best efforts at merely wounding his opponent, Selen ran Captain M through the chest and killed him. A promising life cut short, he later mused, on account of one woman's wanton lusts. 
In the years that followed, he recounted other amorous adventures on the Indian subcontinent. On one occasion, Selen dressed up as a young lady to inveigle his way into a bored wife's bedchamber. The husband, poking his head around the door, thought that he was a girlfriend come to help her dress. While still thus attired, Selen was then propositioned by a drunk gentleman at a ball and had to defend his honour by punching the impudent mountebank full in the face. He also took up with yet another married woman whose husband was, in his words, a prig and an old woman to boot, a little plain, mean-looking fellow with a squeaky voice who looked like a eunuch. Selen, however, found his wife especially beautiful, with one exception. She had bad teeth, a problem he overcame with his usual sang-froid. As I did not admire bad teeth, he wrote, I would only poke this woman in one way, and that was en levrette. She made great opposition at first, but soon got to like it, especially as I said to her, My love, in this attitude you gain an inch. After ten years in India, Selen says that he returned to England and entered into a marriage of convenience to a woman named Sarah Ann Wilds, which had been arranged by his mother. He honeymooned with his new bride in Paris, but was most put out that his over-emotional wife became angry, upset and tearful whenever he looked at paid a compliment to or tried to arrange a rendezvous with any other woman. Moving to a cottage in Devonshire, the couple were jointly disappointed to find out that neither was as wealthy as the other thought they were. Selen moved out and went back to living with his mother, conducting two simultaneous affairs to pass the time. A couple of years later Sarah returned, but by then he was involved with another woman called Emma, and much to Selen's annoyance the ladies hated each other on sight. Promising to end things with Emma, Selen feigned a headache, but while his wife was at church that Sunday morning, instead of terminating the relationship, he invited Emma to his rooms and rutted himself into a stupor. In fact, he was so transported that he lost track of time and had to hide the girl in a side room when Sarah returned home. His day got even more vexing when Sarah found Emma's nightcap in their bed, a situation Selen could not explain although when she questioned him about the comprehensively stained sheets, he angrily tried to convince her that he'd simply ejaculated during a particularly spectacular wet dream. In the ensuing argument, the two came to blows. Selen's wife bit chunks out of the backs of his hands and savagely kicked his shins, while he tightly held her wrists and demanded that she apologise for her outrageous accusations. By the time she complied, Selen had lost over a pint of blood and was confined to bed. As he lay recovering, the family doctor took Mrs Selen to one side and reprimanded her severely. Madam, he warned, be careful what you are about. Your husband has been shamefully ill-used and had he died, as I expected he would, you would have been arraigned at a criminal bar for manslaughter. You are a woman of violent passions. Learn to restrain them. Recovering in bed, Selen watched the exchange and nodded soberly, writing, I had one of my bandaged hands up Emma's clothes while he was saying this and was feeling her lovely young cunny. It was nuts to crack for me. The Selens separated again soon after, and Edward took to driving the mail coach under an assumed name to make ends meet, and opening a short-lived fencing school. Such are the mysteries of the human heart, however, that Sarah returned for a third time, and the two enjoyed some blissful years of happily married life before Mrs. Selen selfishly fell pregnant and stopped paying attention to her husband and his physical needs. What indeed was Selen to do but begin a liaison with an old flame whom he hadn't seen in eleven years, and who, now widowed, took her pleasures where she may? To no doubt give his wife some room to embrace motherhood, he moved into his old flame's lodgings for a month, visiting her boudoir at night through a secret panel built into connecting wardrobes. The final straw for the Selen marriage came when he convinced the headmaster of a local girls' boarding school that he was just the chap to supervise the young ladies on an improving nature ramble. Mrs Selen arrived at the school just in time to see her husband leading a group of teenage girls into the woods for a game of hide-and-seek. The separation soon became final. With his marriage in tatters, Selen took to writing pornographic literature as a -a penny-a-word man for the publisher William Dugdale whose output, incidentally, has given me many hours of pleasure. He also penned some more academic works about the history of Eastern snake worship and a Trieste on the Hindu faith, 
but they were not as well received as his more colourful pieces. Selen was unrepentant at the scorn with which some in society looked upon his erotic penmanship. The saints and hypocrites who will read this will exclaim, What a miscreant this man is! Read thus far, did I say? Oh, fie! Do saints and hypocrites read naughty books? Aye, marry do they, and go home and frig themselves, the beasts, or bugger their footmen? Don't abuse me, you blasted humbugs, members of the Society for the Suppression of Vice. In an attempt to resurrect his fortunes, Selen agreed to accompany a fellow erotic enthusiast on a tour of Egypt. Unfortunately, he only got as far as Vienna before his lustful inclinations got the better of him. After seducing his sleeping companion's teenage mistress in a train carriage, he was further dallying with the girl on his lap when the gentleman woke up. I made a desperate effort to throw her onto the opposite seat, he later wrote, but it was no go, he'd seen us. A row, of course, ensued. In the course of the argument, Selen berated the man for seducing such a young, innocent girl, even though he'd been sporting with her himself not ten minutes before. He was left in Vienna with fifteen pounds to his name, and returned home in an unusually melancholy frame of mind. Shortly thereafter, he met his tragic end in the room of a Piccadilly hotel. Next to Selen's body, they found a poem, addressed to another young lady of his acquaintance. It was entitled, No More, and ended with the words, Vivat lingam non resurgum, long live cock, I shall not rise again. If anybody wants me, I'll be in the study with a copy of The Romance of Lust. I'm feeling somewhat moved. There really isn't that much more to say about Edward Sellen, or how many of the sexual escapades in his autobiography are actually true. I mean, it does read in places like Jay from the Inbetweeners, if you're from the UK, or The Shermanator from the American Pie movies, if you're from the States. You know, I had 15 supermodels in one night last week and they were all begging me for more. You know, that type of stuff. But many of the details about Indian army life in the 1830s and 40s the unusual perils of ocean travel on a sailing ship, bleh, and everyday 19th century life in general are indeed fascinating. And who's to say that Selen wasn't the seedy Casanova that he made himself out to be? As to what it tells us about 19th century moral hypocrisy, or the rights and wrongs of colonialism, well, that's for another kind of podcast. Not this one. I did, however, stumble upon an official report of Selen's court-martial from around the late 1830s on a fascinating website called eroticabibliophile.com. I'll read it in its entirety. Court-martial Ensign Edward Selen, 4th Madras Native Infantry, was charged by Lieutenant Colonel John Green, commanding same regiment, with scandalous and infamous behaviour unbecoming the character of an officer and a gentleman, in having, at Bangalore, 21st of April 1836, without provocation, made use of grossly abusive and highly insulting language towards Lieutenants H. W. Wood and H. Colbeck, both of the same regiment, and in having, at the same time and place, presented a loaded pistol at Lieutenant Wood with intent to shoot him. Upon both of which charges, the court found the prisoner guilty and sentenced him to be discharged the service. Remarks by the Commander-in-Chief As the evidence on the trial affords a strong presumption that Ensign Selen was insane at the time when he considered the offence with which he was charged, I consider him to have been entitled to an acquittal on those grounds and remit the sentence accordingly. Signed, R. W. O'Callaghan, Lieutenant General, and Commander-in-Chief. Ensign Selen has since been transferred to the Madras Pension Establishment. So, unless I read that wrong, Selen somehow managed to avoid the ignominy of being court-martialed and ended up just being quietly shunted off to another position on account of temporary insanity. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a very forgiving Commander-in-Chief. He should have gone into politics or local government. If you're a bit of a bibliophile yourself and you fancy checking out the collected works of Edward Sellen, then I do have a short list here. Next time you have a Zoom meeting, try having some of these on the bookshelf behind you. Herbert Breakspear, Legend of the Maratha War. Annotations on the Sacred Writings of the Hindus. 
the new Epicurean, or the delights of sex, facetiously and philosophically considered. Phoebe Kiss Again Adventures of a Schoolboy, or the Freaks of Youthful Passion The New Lady's Tickler The Ups and Downs of Life That's the title of Selen's autobiography. So, that's Selen's writing. If, as the writer of this episode, I can take one thing away from the experience, it's that finding out en levrette is actually French for doggy style. Life is indeed a journey of learning. Next time on Rogues Gallery Uncovered. What are you looking at? Finding any excuse to have a scrap with 18th century Ireland's most quarrelsome troublemaker, George Fighting Fitzgerald. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks again for all your support. Feel free to get in touch via the show notes with your thoughts and suggestions. Have a great fortnight, stay roguish, and I'll see you yesterday. <laughs>